thank you Neil for inviting me. Uh, it's always such a pleasure to talk about this topic. I really love doing research in this because it's just exploding and there are so many new things almost every day coming out. So it's really great. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful feel for us researchers, you know, being curious and enthusiastic about new things. So Neil asked me to tell you a little bit about what the research community is currently discussing, discoursing about. So uh, what are the benefits of generative AI for business strategy and especially innovation? Because I'm an innovation management uh, scholar by background. Um, so that is where my interests lie. Uh, oh yeah, and this is my introductory slide. Um, these two were quickly made with deep AI and minimal prompt. So uh, I'm a Lego fan. Um, and uh, this is the Lego version of just putting in my name. Uh, and then I said, okay, make me, you know, an AI professor. And that's uh, what the other picture did. So apparently uh, it assumes we're all working in a lab, um, which I thought was interesting. And I'm going to stop a little bit just, you know, after 45 minutes of Neil talking, uh, just to engage you a little bit. So raise your hand if your answer is affirmative. How many of you have used generative AI in the past six months? Okay, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> How many of you think that generative AI will fundamentally change your job, your career, your role, or your companies in the next three years? Okay, the audience is convinced. How many of you are using it every day? Okay, that's a little less. So uh, that's usually what we get. Everyone has played around a little bit with it, is convinced this is an important topic. Um, but every day, maybe not yet. And we do see that generative AI is kind of everywhere, especially since ChatGPT came out, because then it uh, got into the public domain. Um, and lots of stories written about that. I definitely get much more uh, interview, uh, uh, interviews from journalists that, that would like to talk to me about this than with my previous topics. So clearly, there's a lot of interest in that. And also uh, McKinsey's global survey, which just came out in August, uh, shows that respondents across regions, industries, and seniority levels say they're already using generative AI tools. And you find all kinds of um, split ups here. Um, and indeed, Neil, we talked about gender bias. So uh, just before this, so apparently here, it's pretty much, the, it's approximately the same. So that's good to know. Um, and also, what is the main area where it's used? Again, from the same survey, we see marketing and sales, product and service development, service operations. That's really where it's done, crafting first drafts of text documents, uh, identifying trends in customer needs, drafting technical documents. So a lot for drafting a first thing uh, where we then can do not have to work from scratch, but have already something, and I guess that's a little bit the similar idea of ideation and sparks starting somewhere and, and getting different ideas. And just very quickly, uh, what is generative AI? So uh, we do have discriminative models, which is then more about classifying, um, oh, this is a picture of a dog. Is this a picture of a dog? Yes, that's a dog. Um, versus the more generative models where we want to generate another picture of a dog. And then we indeed might get different kinds of things. This is based on a probability function and then really generating new, new pictures of dog. That's sometimes also why you see that they, the eyes are maybe not completely uh, synchronous and so on, uh, but they are getting better with that as well. And AI can, or generate AI can all, uh, generate almost anything in terms of output. So it can generate text, <clears throat> It can generate pictures, it can generate audio, it can generate video. So all kinds of different product outcomes uh, can be used there. And that is also sometimes worrying because they have become so good that you might have heard about deep fakes and so on. So then it's rather difficult to see, was this, is this video real? Is this person really dancing on stage there or something like that? So um, there's also some caution uh, that we need to uh, exhibit here. And of course, uh, the most used definitely also in research um, and also I think in terms of application so far, in terms of more widespread application are the large language models like ChatGPT and co, 
um, or it can draft a design brief, uh, these kinds of things you see in the advertising messages. And I want to make you aware that there are also some European alternatives because most of these uh, um, large language models come from the US um, under the um, law of the US then, but there are Europe, uh, European models like OpenGPTX or Aleph Alpha Luminos. So also try out those, uh, boost Europe a bit, I think that's uh, that's important. Okay, so if we think about large language models and why they are so important, then it's because they have re they exhibit really some clear advantages over uh, other existing AI already. So first of all, they are few short learners. So usually you don't have to you know before you had to massively train a lot of these uh, AI and so on uh, in order to make them understand what you want. But here you can with a few shots they do understand what you actually try to do and they learn from that. They also perform meta learning. So there's no need for extensive retraining uh, of specific tasks. Uh, they have been surprisingly good also in performing tasks that the designers actually did not intend to design into it, right? ChatGPT was, I think, we don't know exactly, but probably not necessarily um, designed in order to make you more creative but we do show in one of our papers that it can make you more creative in terms of output. I think the biggest advantage, and that's also why the public has, you know, has uh, the public explosion has been there, is that you don't need computer scientists to interact with it, but you can interact with it in natural language. So you can tell the program what you look for, and then if the answer isn't that great yet, you you know, you have a dialogue, you redirect it a bit, and then usually relatively quickly, you get output that you were looking for. And we're really just at the beginning. So the development speed is quite incredible. Um, so in 2014, the first uh, generative adversarial networks were there. Uh, in 2017, the first transformers, the first GPT model was in 2018, and now this year, GPT-4 came out. Um, and if you look at the terms of uh, the, the parameters that it can work with, it is also has exploded from 2018 from the ELMO model with 93 million uh, parameters to now 1 trillion parameters taking along. So the quality is improving relatively fast, also in the image generators. So in 2022, you would still, you know, get some, uh, some weird uh, output. In 2023, that has already improved. Uh, uh, I think in terms of output, you still sometimes get weird output and you need to then maybe re-prompt. <laughs> and that also brings me a little bit to, I mean, despite all these opportunities and great things we can do with it, we also should be aware that there are still quite some limitations. So we need to know about that in order to use it in a responsible way. So first of all, the data used for its training obviously has a natural cutoff. So if you use chat GPT, it's based on GPT 3.5, and that usually goes till 2019. If you pay for it, you can now have GPT 4, which is a little bit uh, more, but then anything proprietary is also not in there. So there is some natural cutoff point. We all know in AI that there are problems with the data quality. So uh, we shouldn't assume that they are free of bias just because they are a machine. No, the data that is in there uh, is biased and therefore the algorithms will turn out that bias as well. It can turn out really false information like giving Neil, what was it? Uh, an MSc. An MSc uh, that he never did actually. Uh, <laughs> so that happens and there's also quite some concern that I read in the business press about the inaccuracies of it. So you shouldn't assume that it's accurate necessarily, right? Uh, that means the reliability of these responses are sometimes unclear. It's not validated and so on. It's just a probability function over what is most probable as outcome. That means we have a bit of an expert paradox, as I call it. So in order to judge the outcomes, you need to almost be an expert, right? So you need to be very critical and reflect upon the outcomes that you get. And you need to know about that. That's always what I also tell my students, you know, Try it out in your essays, but you really need to validate. So you need to learn and you need to critically reflect on the outcomes that are there. Then, as Neil also nicely pointed out, it's a bit of a black box. So there's an opaque um, way of working. We don't 
really know, most of us, uh, how it does it, how it works, what the distribution, what the probability function of the distribution looks like, and so on. So that gives us a little bit of feeling of, okay, it's this black box machine that turns out something. And Neil also pointed out some other ethical dilemma, dilemmas like the sustainability of it. It's, you know, every, it's, it's huge server uh, energy and so on. Other things are uh, also they need to have some classification underlying. This is done usually with very cheap labor in Africa and so on. So there are issues that we should be aware of and we hopefully can address also. Nevertheless, uh, I totally agree with Neil that uh, it can absolutely help you for innovation. And uh, um, we published a paper. Luckily, we, we actually got accepted for this paper on the day that ChatGPT came out. So that's, that was quite a coincidence. Um, so this paper is uh, uh, looking into, so the bubble diamond model is a very classic model from innovation management. So any innovation goes through a problem articulation where you diverge and you try to get as many ideas as possible. And then at some point you say, okay, hmm, I now have understood or I have an idea what my problems actually are. So now I have to select the problem that I wanna work on. So you'd converge again and you need to select the model. And then once you have understood what problem you would like to focus on, you again diverge because you want all kinds of potential solutions. So you generate concepts. And then at some point you have to uh, select and develop that concept. So that's, a, that's usual, a usual process within innovation. And what we uh, suggest is that AI augmentation actually helps especially in the divergent phases because you can, you can expand it as Neil's tools nicely point out. That's exactly what his tools do is that you get new ideas, you get stimulated to think about other things. Therefore, you think about more problems and reframe and redesign your problems and therefore consider more. And then in the selection, it's still more the human, although I'm sure it will also come. Then in the concept phase, again, you might get more directions, more ideas, more sparks, and then you converge again. And what it can particularly do well in terms of helping you in your innovation management is, for example, summarization. So these two books, as you can see here, uh, a machine-generated summary of current research on lithium on batteries, or climate, planetary, and evolutionary sciences, and machine-generated literature over here. So they even publish books that are based on that. Um, and what we did for our article that was uh, published is we uh, let uh, ChatGPT, uh, no, it was GPT-3, uh, not ChatGPT at that point, um, uh, generate the abstract. So the abstract was completely written by GPT-3, and then we did a minor language editing, but it was really minor. But the content was based on that because that was the, that was the essence of the article. So it's very, very good in summarizing long text and bringing you the kind of the, the essence of it, which does give productivity advantages. But that's not all. It can also really generate insights and that's then more than just productivity and then making things very easy to read. So for example, uh, a common task also in innovation management, also in marketing is sentiment analysis. So here we took, um, we took reviews from, I think it was Amazon um, on a particular project and we, a product and we just asked it to you know, do a sentiment analysis for that. And it can really do that. So it's a scalable approach to understanding these sentiments it can apply to unstructured data. So you don't need to have the data in a particular format. Uh, it makes it easier to identify certain customer needs. So going, you know, doing this on your customer reviews will give you open opportunities. It also answers questions with information only implicitly stored in the data source, similar to what uh, Neil did in the end to kind of find the open spots and the, the connections and also understands why people like particular features. So you can ask it for that here as well. And then as we, uh, as we already said, it can really be helpful for idea generation. So this is an example from uh, Syverson. Uh, and uh, they asked, how might we help young people turn saving money into a lifelong habit? And then come out all kinds of ideas, like allowing the user to share their saving goals uh, with friends and have a community. So kind of, you know, 
uh, gamifying it a bit, um, fund budget to, to, to fragment a little bit what to, uh, to spend the money for, uh, and so on. And uh, I was just at a workshop uh, in Delft also on creativity and AI, and they had the question, uh, how might we um, increase um, turnout at elections? Because in the Netherlands, there are elections today, Exactly. So it was a very relevant question. And I was amazed, and we did a human uh, AI hybrid group. I was amazed with what came out, you know, especially if you if you kept on generating. So the, the first idea is often now, you know, pretty common what you would also think of. But then if you trigger it further, you get quite some some divergent ideas. So that was interesting to see. So all of these are really nice things of, of how to help you in your innovation project, in your process as such. Uh, but you can have other examples here as well. So for example, uh, speeding up drug discovery with diffusion generative models. So really uh, having a lot of data um, and then uh, being able to find drugs faster than traditional methods. Uh, reduce the potential for adverse side effects. So I think there are lots of opportunities in, in very important business fields uh, where we can use this. And of course, you can also, because these more open generative models always have the problem of also proprietary information. It's one, so you can also use the API and build your own closed system and then fine tune the models with your own enterprise data. Obviously, you shouldn't, you know, openly <laughs> put your enterprise data into the open models because it's opaque. You don't know what they do with it. So be aware of that. But there are lots of opportunities. So that's also, I think, why Neil uh, decided to have the major kind of closed and then feeding in from the, um, from the open models. <coughs> And this example I also really liked. So, uh, because so far we mainly talked about text, but you can also do a lot with images, which is really nice for innovation management if you want to do rapid prototyping and so on. So this is Patagonia and Ikea um, working together as a brand alliance. This is fake. Patagonia and Ikea are not doing this at the moment. So this was a user uh, who said, okay, they could actually nicely fit together. So why, you know, let's make up some, you know, some themes and so on. So you could have the, you know, uh, Patagonia could go a little bit inside. Ikea could go more into the outside space. They both have maybe uh, uh, to some extent share some values uh, and we could nicely, you know, make that look of Patagonia into Ikea. I thought it was a hilarious example. So Eric uh, Grosa, thank you for that. But that's just how you see how you could very quickly think about some things, test it out, what would it look like? And you can really then imagine it much better, I think, than if you uh, have just text and descriptions and so on. So what it can do, it can really generate first ideas in seconds and visualize it. So for rapid prototyping, I think it's awesome. <laughs> And we can take this a step further even in designing. So uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, Takamarian, for example, uh, in Boston, uh, they also do this. So there are different approaches to generative AI design. You generate new design concepts first, you then calculate the performance of different concepts, and then you make a concept selection uh, and so on. But with generative AI, you can also discover really unobvious solutions. So that's one example of uh, Tim Simpson et al. Um, where they actually asked for particular structures and they got this, is it a bird, is it a plane? It was actually for a boat. So from an ergonomics point of view, apparently, this is a very good, and for that particular material, this is a very good design for a boat. And it's not very obvious, right? You wouldn't really imagine this as a boat. So then you can explore that further. And you can also put that together. So that's exactly what's... Uh, uh, what Tucker and his colleagues are doing. So you first have images and text of competition and on your concepts, product reviews and so on. They tell you kind of what are the uh, trends at the moment uh, and so on. You predict customer sentiment of particular product attributes and then automatically let uh, generative adversarial networks design it. So these examples are all completely designed based on that. So then we are very close to automation already. So that would be a more of a shift from the augmentation to the automation. Um, but these things are possible. 
Another big player uh, or big application field that I see is code. So you can write pretty well code. You can write code pretty well. So uh, GitHub, GitHub uh, Copilot, uh, but also uh, general. Uh, so also ChatGPT. I've been told because I'm no coder, so I have only heard this from coders. Can be very good in writing code. Um, my uh, cousin, for example, she writes a lot of code for a company. She said it's amazing because you know I just put it in, I control it, I check for it, I try it out, and it works so quickly and gives me also new ideas for particular code. So there was a study um, that looked into um, Copilot, so GitHub Copilot, and the group with Copilot was 55% faster. And they say, okay, that is going to change the industry. So almost half the code on average is written by Copilot. That alone is mind boggling. Or here's some empirical uh, experimental evidence on the productivity effects, um, where also we see especially the speeding up is one of the large benefits uh, we observe. And, and that's where my personal interest is. It can also really help creativity. So it can help us overcome limitations of very traditional creativity techniques uh, like brainstorming. So even though we are in the creativity uh, kind of um, research area, we know that traditional brainstorming is actually not a very good method because it has particular problems. It is still used a lot in a lot of organizations. Um, and why is that? Because Osborne in uh, 1957 says, okay, the average person can think up twice as many ideas when working with a group than when working alone. And this claim is still kind of prevalent, but it actually has been shown to not hold. That's why we have all these kinds of creativity techniques like brain writing, where you first sit by yourself and think of ideas and then maybe discuss. Why is that? Why are groups actually not that great uh, for creativity? It's mainly because of two negative effects. One is production blocking. So whenever you are in a group and you have an idea and someone else is speaking, you cannot put out your idea. So you are blocked in your production. You have to wait to take turns. And also social inhibition. So for all kinds of reasons, you might not be inclined to reveal your idea. Right? You might be socially inhibited. Maybe you feel like, mm, this is a foolish idea. I don't want to put it out. Or ah, this colleague is also up for promotion. I don't want to share my ideas. I mean, for all kinds of reasons, there might be social inhibition. While at the same time in the group, we also have this cognitive stimulation, of course, because you, know, you get other ideas in. So you are cognitively, cognitively stimulated by the other people. And what we felt was like, okay, if we think about a hybrid, what we call a hybrid group, so one person working with an AI, you would get that cognitive stimulation. You would get the sparks, as Neil would call it. But at the same time, you don't have production blocking because you are in control. The AI will patiently wait until you have had your ideas. And you also probably don't have social inhibition because at the moment you're not revealing it with another human, just with the machine, and no one really looks back at that. So that's, uh, that's, that was our thinking to do, um, to do an experiment on that. And our results indeed show that first of all, the total numbers of ideas were much higher in the hybrid group, um, second highest in the nominal group and lowest in the interactive group. So we also validate what earlier research did that working alone actually is better in terms of productivity than working in the group. But we also then, uh, kind of looked into what is the number of creative ideas, because that's what we're usually interested in. Now you can have a lot of ideas, but you're actually interested in the creative ideas. And also there we find uh, that the hybrid groups score it better. And that's because in creativity research, often productivity, so quantity breeds quality. So if you have a lot of ideas, you usually also have more creative ideas. And we do find uh, this in our research. We're currently uh, trying to publish it, so it's not out there yet, but there's a conference paper if you're interested. So should we just replace humans with AI? I think it's clear from my talk that I'm not for that because uh, I feel there's a lot to gain from each other and working together, but automation, at some, I mean, some tasks might be automated, but I think the big benefit, especially at the moment, is in augmentation. So uh, we think we will come to something like hybrid intelligence, which has been defined by Delaman as the ability to achieve complex goals by combining human and machine intelligence, thereby reaching superior results to those each of them could have 
accomplished separately and continuously improved by learning from each other. <laughs> so it does really, I think we need to learn from the machines as well as they need to learn from us. And it's really in this augmentation, in this hybrid way of working that we can have uh, more productivity and better quality uh, ideas, especially. And there's another interesting paper that just came out. It's a, it's a work SSRN working paper, so I'm sure they are also currently in the process of, uh, of publishing it, that uh, did a major uh, field experiment uh, at a, one of the major consulting firms. Um, and what they find is something like a, what they call an AI technologic, technological frontier. And it's not really clear. It, there's no clear definition of where that lies because it's shifting, obviously, and might depend also on the, on the context and the company. But basically what they find is for tasks that are within that AI technological frontier, so where AI is really good in augmentating, that uh, their consultants had a higher productivity and better quality. So validating the results we also found. And this was especially prominent for those with a low, what they call a baseline kind of skill. So for those that are maybe not so good usually in this task, the gain is much more. So I think that relates to the creativity skills that uh, Neil was also talking about. And if you don't have so many creativity skills, maybe you're not so experienced because Everyone can learn also some creativity with the, with the right techniques and so on. There, the boost is especially big. If you're already you know, very creative and you know all the techniques and you are a domain expert and you have intrinsic motivation, maybe the increase, the boost is not as much. But outside this AI technological frontier, humans alone were better than AI augmented consultants. So that's interesting. So there is there are certain tasks where the human is still better because maybe the AI distracts you, um, keeps you busy with things that you're actually not, should not be working on at that moment and so on. So I think we need to be aware of some over-reliance and it's always very difficult to say upfront whether we over-relied, we usually can do this in retrospect. So that's a little bit the challenge where we are, I think. But I think it's good to also think about, okay, for what task can it really help? Where do I do? But where do I also make a cut and, and rely maybe on humans? By the way, in our experiments with the interactive groups and the hybrid and nominal groups, we also asked people for what, which interactions did you enjoy the most? And then clearly the interactive group outperformed the other two groups. So people like to talk to other humans. So if your goal maybe in an innovation management process is to, you know, to also sell that then to get ownership for ideas, to move it on, maybe the interactive group is better, even though it doesn't produce the best creative ideas, but at least you have buy-in and so on. So I think you need to think about where do I want to have this augmentation, what for, uh, and then um, according to the task, set it in. Okay, so... Uh, Perfect, on time as well, I'm very proud of myself. Uh, the key takeaways uh, that I think you can have is um, <laughs> it really does affect uh, a lot of aspects, almost every aspect of innovation and your product development. Uh, AI I will not replace humans, humans using AI will replace those that aren't. I think that's a, that we hear all the time and uh, I only buy into that uh, with this whole concept of hybrid intelligence. And I really do think we should embrace it but be aware of its limitations um, and let it inspire you to innovate. We have one question and that hand went up very, very quickly. At least just coming with the microphone. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, Gary. I'm an MBA uh, alum uh, and an architect and interior designer. And I see an enormous amount of this sort of CGI AI produced conceptualization, which I find it actually, for me, it's terrifying yeah. because those things can be so, particularly where you show the prototyping and you see the benefits of this prototyping, yeah. they can be enormously misleading because they yes. look result, because they make the, the imagery incredibly convincing that people think all of the, all of the thinking process is done, let's just build that, it'll, it'll work. And actually it doesn't. I think there's an enormous risk of those things being too convincing and people really need to step back and say, well, could I tell the image to give me a sketch? <laughs> Something that is intuitive and descriptive, but without being overly sold. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that, that, that to me is, is a massive risk that people work with, with it, particularly within production of product, 
rather than build business models and other uh, sort of slightly more intellectual based things, mm -hmm. when you've got a product that's going to come out, you've really got to spend a bit more time feeling it and understanding it before you trusted uh, a, a, an AI to produce something that looks realistic. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. So again, that calls for the hybrid approach in that, you know, we shouldn't just believe everything. Uh, and actually our next studies are on this, you know, over-reliance aspects of, okay, what happened, what happens there? What could be kind of the, you know, the, the more long-term unintended consequences of using this too much? So I think this is an excellent example. And that's why critical reflection is so important in using it. So that's also what I always tell my students, critical reflection when using these tools. Absolutely. Yes. Vera, thank you much for a fantastic talk.